I believe he wants to speak to us today. Um, stay standing. Let's just jump right in. Romans chapter 12 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Somebody say transformed. transformed. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Oh, there it is. What we've we been talking about? I'm talking about the soul. And your soul's made up of what? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. The renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let me pray for you and we're going to uh, we're going to jump right in. Heavenly Father, um, I pray that today we would think about what we think. We don't think about that enough. <laughs> God, help us to think about that more. God, would you bring renewal in our minds? Father, would you bring renewal in our souls as a result of the renewal in our minds? And God, if there's any blind spots in our lives, if there's any blind spots in how we're thinking, about this world that we live in and who we're called to be and who you are and how all of those things are wrapped up into one bigger thing, would you point out those blind spots? We give you this time, Lord, and we pray in your name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. High five somebody and grab a seat and get your Bible out and get ready. And I'll just tell you, today's going to be a little different, uh, a little more conversational as uh, compared to what we normally do and, and that you're probably going to have to think a little harder. Oh, what did you not have coffee? You have a Yeti in your hand. It's huge. Okay. We're, we're going to have to think some to go where I believe God wants to take us. And just in case you haven't been with us this summer, we're talking about our souls all summer long. And our souls are made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. We're talking about our souls. We're training our souls so that it can be well with our souls. In fact, this whole season this summer is called Soul Training here at Revolution Church. But I want to jump into kind of phase two of training our souls today. We're going to be in the realm of the mind. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's about your mind. Yeah, it's all about how you think. And really what we're going to talk about is your world view. What is your world view? And where does that come from? You know, scientists say that we have somewhere between 12 and 60,000 thoughts per day. So we think a lot. We think about a lot. And as your mind is kind of going and blowing 12 to 60,000 thoughts a day, what's happening is your worldview is being formed literally minute to minute. And it's kind of hard to have a healthy soul if you have a murky worldview. And it's kind of hard to have a healthy soul if you have a really jacked up worldview. It's hard to have a healthy soul if you're always kind of ping-ponging between the light, the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of darkness. See, the problem with worldview is it's, it's well, worldview is the best thing I could think of. They're like belly buttons. We all have one, but we don't talk about it. <laughs> Come on, that's true, isn't it? If you're walking around talking about your belly button, you're just weird, okay? <laughs> and most people don't talk about worldview. You, you probably didn't have family dinner last night and look at your kids and say, let's talk about worldview, kids, okay? Probably didn't happen. Another metaphor, I guess, would be worldviews are kind of like computer operating systems. It's, you're not thinking about your computer's operating system. You're just using the computer. And then one day you're like, man, this thing ain't working like it used to. Why is this thing going so slow? And it's because you haven't cleaned out your cache. You haven't dealt with your cookies. So you, you got all, I don't know what all the, the nerdy computer terms are, but, but you, haven't, you haven't worked on it, right? You haven't spent some time making sure that machine is healthy. Worldview is a lot like that. What would be a definition for worldview? Well, here's going to be our working definition. Worldview is an all-encompassing perspective on everything that exists and matters to us. So your worldview really represents your most fundamental beliefs, your most fundamental assumptions about our world, about our, our universe. It, it reflects 
how you would answer like the big questions in life, right? And as you mature, isn't it true, you begin to have more and more of these big questions and you start to ponder and, and think about these questions. I'm talking about questions like, is there a God? Questions like, well, what is truth? And if there really is such a thing as ultimate absolute truth, can anyone even know that truth? Questions like, where did the universe come from? Where did this all start? And where is this all going? What's the meaning of life? Does my life have purpose? What's the meaning of life? Let's personalize it. Does my life matter? What am I supposed to do with my life? And, and on that note, what does it mean to live a good life? These are big questions. And these are worldview questions. Here's another great worldview question. Are humans basically just really smart apes with superior hygiene and fashion? People ask that question. Or is there more to us than that? You get the idea, right? Worldview, worldview. Worldview is everything, I would say, because it affects all things. So then when you think about the fact that we don't really think about worldview much, and you look at, wow, it literally affects everything, you could see that we could be in dangerous territory if we don't think about our worldview. Your worldview directly influences how you would answer and think about all those big life questions related to truth. And there is a battle going on today for truth. Yeah. Is there not? Yeah. There is a huge battle going on today for truth. And if you're a Jesus follower, part of what we believe is that God is truth. To get real theological with you, it, it is not correct to say God contains truth. No, no, no. God literally is the embodiment of all truth. Absolute, unchanging across all human history, across all of the universe, truth. That's God. Look at what it says in Colossians chapter 2 about this truth. It says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding podcasts and YouTube videos. <laughs> now, high-sounding nonsense that comes from what? Human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Now, remember, we are humans, so that would include us. This, this isn't just talking about people outside the church that don't believe in God. It's talking about you. It's talking about me, which is why we're calling this blind spots. So we know there's this battle between the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, and the kingdom of darkness. We know that battle's going on. We know we are called to walk in the light. The Bible calls us children of the light. And here's the thing about grabbing a hold of God's worldview and walking in the light. God's worldview will help you walk in the light by helping you recognize and reject the dark. So just in case you're sitting there, I hope this statement hits you hard. If you're sitting there going, oh, I talk about worldview. Here we go. Why do we have to talk about worldview? Is this really that important? Oh, yeah. In fact, this might be the most important thing we could talk about when you look at what's going on in the world right now. We need God's worldview. And God has stamped this on the soul of every single person he has ever created. Did you know that? Maybe these people, some of us, some of them are not thinking about it, but God has stamped it right on our soul. It says in Romans chapter one, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now for you to suppress the truth, it's got to be there. For what can be known about God is, wow, plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived <laughs> ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Nobody gets a free pass is what that means. And we are all called to figure out truth. Now, God clearly has a worldview for us, right? And I would argue it's actually the only worthwhile worldview. And it's not really a thing, it's a person and his name, can anyone guess it's church, just, just say Jesus. 
Jesus Christ is God's worldview. As Jesus followers, we are called to have a Christ-centric view of the world. That is our worldview. A God-centered worldview. Jesus actually talked about this. Couldn't have been more clear. Look at John chapter 14. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He did not say, I am a way, a truth, and one of the options for your life. Jesus literally said, I'm actually the only way. No one comes to the Father except through me. So see right there, let's just talk about a part of worldview. If you don't believe Jesus is the only way, you cannot be a Christian. You can't. You can't mix in anything else because Jesus made it crystal clear. So for you to say, well, I, I follow Jesus, but I think there's other ways. That is intellectually dishonest. Because you would have to ignore where Jesus said, no, 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 I'm, I'm the only option. You have to scratch that out of the Bible. You see how that works? John chapter 8, here's something else Jesus said. And he said this to people who believed in him. The scripture's clear. He said, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. You don't get to scratch stuff out. You can get to mix other things in. And you will know, here it is again, the truth, not a truth. And the truth will set you free. So I just want to ask you a question. If you're a Christian, why? You ever think about that? You have an answer to that? If you're a Jesus follower, why? Why? Uh, we're going to answer that question in coming weeks. And, and one of my favorite answers, and there's a lot of different answers, but part of my answer is, is that Jesus is the only worldview on a whole nother level. That's why. Like, this is one of the reasons I follow Jesus. Following Jesus produces the most consistent fruit, the most power, the best results across all of human history. So we have to choose either Jesus or, check it out, the world's apostrophe, possessive, y'all. Whoops. It's hard to spell on stage. View. The world's view. Now, again, God's worldview is Jesus. God is at the center. Over here, you have a man-centered worldview. God's not at the center. Man's at the center. God's not the thing. Man's the thing. This is a humanistic thing. This is a man-woman-centered thing. It's naturalistic. It's materialistic. It's humanistic. It rises and falls on all kinds of theories that just don't add up. For example, evolution would be one, which evolution is pretty ironic, isn't it? Because if you take just the 20 physical laws that science agrees upon, science and physics, and, and you break any one of those laws or just even tweak it just a, a teeny tiny bit, then this whole entire universe implodes and explodes, doesn't it? <laughs> it's kind of funny. So even science itself is saying, no, we operate on absolute truth. Truth. Let's talk about truth. What does the world, the world's view, say about truth? The world's view says that truth is internal. You get to decide truth. Does anyone, show a hand, see how quickly this can go wheels off, cuckoo crazy and dangerous it is? But this is what the world's view is today. Truth is internal. You decide your truth. Truth is relative. You live your truth and I'll live my truth. It sounds so nice and sweet and sexy and special. And, and it's actually so crazy that it actually says, okay, you live your truth and you live your truth, and both truths are true, even if the two truths disagree with each other. How moronic and illogical is that? But that is actually what the world says today. It's absurd. In fact, hey, if somebody asks you about truth, and you get into a conversation about truth, and they say, well, I don't believe in absolute truth, just ask them, is that absolute? Just ask him that. 
Because the world's view, this truth is relative thing, even the relativist says, like, I'm absolutely certain no truth exists. <laughs> Again, it's, it's a self-refuting world view. I told y'all, you're going to have to wake up today. <laughs> you're going to have to lean in today. Like, we would all agree, we live by all kinds of absolutes. The law of thermodynamics, the law of gravity. Like, if I go downtown tomorrow and I climb to the the top of the Tower of Americas, and I say, you know what? I don't feel like gravity matters. <laughs> gravity is judging me. I'm not feeling it, and I jump. I'm going to be feeling it all right. Because <laughs> it's absolute truth, right? Now, what's different about following Jesus? Well, when you follow Jesus, truth is external. You don't decide truth. You discover truth. And the truth that we're hoping you discover has a name. His name is Jesus. So with God's worldview, with the Jesus life, okay, truth is external. It's absolute. You uncover it. You discover it. And again, we all live by absolute truth. The world says, no, no, no. Truth is like on a sliding scale. That is a sick worldview that will never take you anywhere healthy. And it's so interesting how as we, over time we've taken God out of math, we've taken God out of psychology and history and health and education systems and government and communities and everyday life, how quickly we have crashed and spiraled downward. We have forgotten God is the beginner. God is the designer. God is the truth. You may have never heard a pastor link God with math. God is the truth behind all of those subjects. God is the one that made any of those things exist. Now, what we do too often as Jesus followers, again, is we ping pong back and forth, at least in some areas of our life, between these two world views. And so maybe, for example, you say, well, God, I love your grace. I love your forgiveness. I totally accept that. But standing up for my faith, having some courage? I'm not sure about that. God, I love you. I even love your word. But some of the stuff in your word that's required of me, whew, I don't dig that, God. God, I'm all about, man, your unconditional love. But, but speaking up against what the world says about something like same-sex marriage, I'm not sure I want to do that. I'm not sure about that. This is how we ping pong between God's view and the world's view. Now, again, for clarity, this is not a sermon collection to get you all riled up. Yeah, the world's wrong, man. Way to go, preacher. You get them. Like, if you're looking for that, that's not what we're doing. Okay? We're talking about you. We're talking about me. We're talking about blind spots in our own lives that are making our souls unhealthy. We're working on our worldview. We're working on our soul. Tell your neighbor it's about my soul. You see, because of our selfishness, because of our pride, if we're not careful, we can all slide from the Jesus life into this me-centered thing that I am calling the world's view. And then we wonder why things are the way they are, why right is wrong, wrong is right, everything's inverted and perverted, and we wonder, and this is part of the reason. Because even in the church, we've, we've done this. We've done this. We have to think about how we think. This is complex. This is deep. We're just barely scratching the surface and diving in today. We'll just barely scratch the surface in, in three weeks of talking about this. But if today you would simply say, I choose God's worldview. I choose the Jesus life. Then you can start to uncover some things that are maybe making your soul unhealthy. You can start to get your mind going in the right direction. You can begin to lead your soul and read your soul and feed your soul what it needs so it can be well with your soul. So we have these thoughts, right? Again, 12,000 to 60,000, somewhere in there. That is a lot of thoughts. And what we've got to do with the thoughts in our mind is kind of install a filter right after we have the thoughts. 
Just like an HVAC, HVAC system, if, if you don't have a good filter, a clean filter, the HVAC system will get real unhealthy to stop working. It won't put out the, the cool air that's so important to us in the San Antonio summers. Y'all know what I'm saying? You kind of got to install a filter on your soul. And you've got to allow that filter to filter your thoughts. Okay, so for example, with our emotions, let's talk about emotions because everybody's got feelings, right? Nothing but those feelings. We all got some feelings. And God gave us feelings, so feelings are inherently bad. I don't think they're inherently good, but I do think we have to be very, very careful with our feelings. And we're going to talk about feelings at length in August. We'll take that jump in August, but I wanted to mention it today because in God's worldview, emotions are the byproduct of filtering your thoughts, filtering your emotions. Their feelings are filtered when we follow Jesus. But in the world's view, feelings are not filtered. Feelings are turned into facts. Think about how quickly this one can go rails off. Crazy cuckoo, downward spiral, you see? And in today's world, we have actually made feelings the foundation of everything. Here's what I have to say about that. Yikes. Because I'll be honest about how my feelings work. And they ain't always pretty. Anybody else agree with that? So what happens here is instead of filtering your feelings so that you can get to ultimate truth, you just turn your feelings into the ultimate truth. And the worst part about this is that in today's world, people are so overwhelmed with their feelings and have made them so foundational that a lot of people literally can't even understand this concept we're talking about right now. Wow. And I would say that's a demonic thing. I tell you all the time, I'm not a devil under every bush guy, but I am a devil under every other bush guy. Because he is real, and he does exist, and he does hate us, and he does want to steal, kill, and destroy every good thing in our lives. He has blinded the minds, the eyes of so many people. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that Satan has blinded, y'all skip down to the end, Satan has blinded the minds. He's really good at that. You think about Adam and Eve, the way he got them to fall was by blinding their mind, by lying to them. So the enemy, this blind spots thing, man, he's really good at giving us blind spots. So my prayer has been that we could somehow grab onto truth today. Okay, so another example. Let's say you wake up today in the realm of feelings and you go, you know what? I don't feel like intersections matter anymore. <laughs> Just like gravity, I feel judged by intersections. I'm not stopping at them. Okay, fine but before long you're gonna get hurt or you're gonna hurt someone else, right? Now we all go, well, let's look at an extreme example. I'm trying to show you how stupid, and I will call it absolutely stupid, it is to allow your emotions to immediately become truth, to turn them into facts, to make them the foundation. Okay, I gotta move. So let's talk about the will. You got your mind, your will, your emotions. What is the will? The will is that behavior part of your soul, right? And when you're following Jesus, the, the will, it, it's all about like, well, and we're not perfect. We all know that, right? Does everybody agree? Like none of us are perfect. We're never going to get this perfectly perfect. But, but over here, like your whole entire intention of your heart, your will is I want to glorify God. Just want to glorify God. Now you might not always get it right, but that's what you want to do. That's what the will of your soul wants to do. It wants to follow Jesus. It wants to glorify God. But over here in the world's view, the will is no. Me, 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 with some other me, on top of the me, 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 me. It's glorify myself. Glorify myself. And over time, your behavior begins to reflect that. And again, this is where you start mixing the emotions with the will. You start mixing the feelings with the behavior. My feelings are now facts. Everything's about me. Whoa. Watch out, somebody. This is how it all falls to pieces. And on that one, if you're like, well, I'm not sure that's really true, just get on social media. 
for a few minutes. And you'll see this is true like that. You'll see it's true so, so quick. What about the goals of these different worldviews? Well, following Jesus, again, we're not perfect, but the goal is that we would become holy. The goal is personal holiness, is it not? In the world's view, the goal is all about happy, happy, happy. How can I be happy? What makes me happy? And this is why you can even find churches today flying rainbow gay trans flags out front saying they still are Jesus followers even though they're ignoring massive chunks of scripture and you're looking at it and you're going how has this gotten into the church it's because even in the church remember this is about us y'all yeah, yeah. even in the church sometimes we have served up this come on get happy stuff <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with being happy, but life is not all about being happy. It is about following Jesus and becoming more and more holy. I'm just trying to show you the difference between the two, that only one gets you anywhere good, and that the other just leads to a world falling to pieces. This is a lot to chew on. A lot to chew on. I told you I wasn't going to have pretty sermon notes for you today. A lot that you on. Come to the next service. Probably be different. We got a lot swimming around up here with worldview. But I just want to ask you today, like, if you had to come up here and circle one side, what is your worldview? Is it Jesus or is it the world's view? Or are you thinking right now, I might have to draw my dot right in the middle because I've got some ways I'm kind of ping-ponging back and forth, I think I might have some blind spots. And just another example, and I like the extreme examples because it's what's actually going on if we choose the world's view. Like if you choose Jesus, but you're sitting there going, I, but I, wanna, I do wanna do like my thing in this one realm, you're not choosing Jesus. You're ping-ponging. You're mixing in some relativism. And if you want to do that, like, who are you to tell me murder is wrong? I kind of enjoy murder. I kind of like it. It makes me happy. Do you see how stupid and short-sighted it is to mix in the world's view or to allow some blind spots to remain? Here's what Paul wrote to Timothy. Okay, so this is the Apostle Paul speaking to a young church leader, this guy led a church, and he tells Timothy, oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Because he was dealing with worldview. And Timothy's church was mixing in all kinds of stuff. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have ping-ponged, swerved swerved from the faith. <laughs> and if you don't think the Bible's funny, you got to read the next line. Paul's like, that's, that's all I got. Grace be with you. <laughs> Bless your heart. That's what he's saying. <laughs> I will be praying for you, Timothy. But I love the warning. Be on guard. Be careful. The gospel is not a humanistic man-centered thing. It's a God-centered thing. It's a Jesus thing. You've got to think about what you think. Yeah. Everything you think, you've got to put it through the filter of Jesus, of God's world view. Or you have a faulty filter that's not going to lead you to a good place. And here's a great question. You might just jot this down. Like every decision, every thought, every interaction you have with somebody else, this is a great question to ask yourself. You can just say, hey, self, hey, soul, come on, my soul. Remember, we've got to train our souls. You just say, come on, my soul, let's think about this. Does this move the football of faith forward in my life, or does it not? Because every single day, all day, you, your kids, our world, we're being hammered with the world's view. The news does it. 
ESPN does it. I thought they reported on sports. Disney does it. The music industry does it. Hollywood does it. Universities and colleges and high schools and junior highs and elementaries and preschools do it. And we wonder what's wrong. And parents, by the way, a quick word for you as you lead your children. Today, kids are being raised on relativism. And you may not think they are, but they are. And you may think you have them in the, the right school, but guess what? Their phone's into this stuff. The second you put a computer, a phone, a tablet in their hand, boom, they have access to all of it. And you can't stop it. And I don't even think it's productive to try to stop it. What's better is to teach them the Jesus life. To teach them, hey, that's the world's view. We're choosing the Jesus life. And our kids need education, yes, but I would argue that schools, for the most part, they don't teach kids how to think. That's not their job. They just teach material and then test the children. We have to teach our kids how to think, to think about what they think. That's probably the very best parenting wisdom that any parent could have for the world today, to think about worldview, to watch your kids' worldview. Now, I don't encourage you to sit down at every, uh, you know, family dinner and say, pass the green beans, let's talk about worldview. Because I've got, uh, no, you got to do it in a little more clandestine way, if you know what I'm saying. Last thing about worldview. Last thing, and then we'll wrap up. You see, one of the things that we have to kind of understand if we're ever going to get to the Jesus life, to the only worthwhile worldview is that we actually all have the exact same problem, S-I-N. And I love that the middle letter is I. Have you ever thought about that? Here's one way to say it. You are your biggest problem. Have you ever thought about that? Your biggest problem is not out there. You are your biggest problem. I am my biggest problem. Might not want to admit that. Almost nobody does. But it's true, and the reason that it's true is that we are born into sin. And we have to deal with that problem with integrity. So sin, one thing I love about sin, you love something about sin? There's one good thing about it. It introduces the concept of personal responsibility, does it not? which is a pretty important one. Now, the world's view is sin, that's not your fault. That's somebody else's fault. You don't have any responsibility to deal with that. You are a victim. All of that messed up stuff in your life, you don't have any personal responsibility. You don't have any personal agency. It was all done to you. You're a product of the family you grew up in, the country you grew up in, the neighborhood. Now, I am not saying that those things do not factor in. They definitely factor in. But at the end of the day, everyone has a choice. That's the Jesus worldview. Wow. But that is definitely not the world's view. That you're born into sin that you are your biggest problem. And so look at the solutions for this, because I just want you to see how, how different of a direction they go in. See, if you don't think that you have a sin problem, then your solution is pride. Is it not? It's not sin, have pride. Man, you just be who you are because none of that stuff is your fault. You're not going to be held accountable for any of that. The world's view says that tolerance is the answer. Now, quick point of clarity. Do not confuse acceptance with tolerance, please. God's worldview is that we accept everybody. And here at Revolution Church, we accept everybody. I don't care. Rich, poor, old, young, white collar, blue collar, you name it. We love everybody here. You can be accepted. But, but that's not tolerance. The world's view of acceptance is a twisted thing. Tolerance is the word that 
I thought of. Tolerance is different. Tolerance says you have to accept, but you also have to approve. And I would argue that in today's world, tolerance also says, and now you even have to celebrate with pride. But the Jesus life, it ain't about tolerance, it's about repentance. Because in the Jesus life, we understand, oh my gosh, I have to deal with integrity with the greatest problem I have, myself, my sin. And so in the Jesus life, the answer is not pride. The answer is a person who went to a cross and paid for your sins. His name is Jesus. The answer is not tolerance. The answer is humility. The answer is not pride. The answer is laying down our lives at the foot of the cross. The answer is that Jesus Christ is exactly what he said he is. The only way. I'll tell you a story I've told many times. When we first moved here to start the church in summer of 2009, we didn't have a, there, there were no people. It was me and my wife and my son at the time. There was no church building, there was no office. And so as we started meeting people, I needed a place to kind of work and, and I needed to kind of get out of the house, you know, from time to time. And so I, I did most of my work sitting at Starbucks right up here on the interstate. And there was this one guy, I got to know him really well. He was always there working on his laptop, sipping a latte while I was working on my laptop, drinking me some espresso. Just two dudes all jittered out all the time, <laughs> having a good old time. And I got to know this guy probably over about six months. And as our church was beginning public worship services in January of 2010, I kind of realized one day sitting in the coffee shop, I'd never asked the guy what he does. So I said, hey man, I, and I'm, I don't want to share his name and that makes sense in a second. Let's just call him Frank, okay? I said, hey Frank, uh, I've never asked you, what do you do? And he leaned really close to me and he goes, do you really want to know what I do? And I said, yeah. And he said, you promise you won't be offended? And I said, I'm like, what, is, what does this dude do? This, now I'm curious, yeah. And he goes, well, I have a, uh, a bunch of pornographic websites and I manage all of it right here. I schedule the actors and actresses and cameramen and make sure the production's happening and I do all of it from right here and it's very, very successful and my family's well taken care of and I make a lot of money doing it. And he goes, what do you do? And I was like, well, <laughs> I said, I kind of do the opposite of what you do. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, uh, I moved here to start a church and we just started our worship services this week. And he didn't even like bat an eye. He was like, oh, that's awesome. Man, I love entrepreneurs. I was like, thank you, Jesus. Like, <laughs> he saw me as an entrepreneur. He is an entrepreneur. I'm just kind of a spiritual entrepreneur, right? And, and so we just carried on the conversation in the coming months. And, and the guy started asking these great questions. And it was so, so crazy. Every one of his questions was a worldview question. They were all worldview questions. Great questions about like, where do you think we came from? And, do you think there's really such a thing as evil? I'm like, yeah, it's you. Like, <laughs> how do you not see this, buddy? Like, you know, he said, do you really think there's such a thing as happiness? And, you know, he, he even asked about emotions. And, and here's the thing. I could tell this guy loved his family. He would brag about his wife and his kid. He loved them so, so much. And then one day, his wife left him. Shocker right? And it was partially because of what he did professionally. And he was so broken. And he came into the coffee shop crying that day. And I prayed with him and I invited him to church and he shows up at church. And when he showed up at church, no one else knew what he did, but I knew what he did. And I didn't make him sit in the back and I didn't reject him. I accepted him. I loved him, but I never once approved of his worldview never once approved of his business, never once approved of what he did, certainly didn't celebrate it. And after a few weeks of attending church, this guy's on the front row, breaking down, full on breaking down, and he gives his life to Jesus. His family had, 
His family had fallen to pieces though. And his first questions, I was like, he's like, I think we got a lot to talk about. And I said, yep, let's talk at Starbucks. I'll see you tomorrow. His first set of questions were all about basically like, how do I get out of this dark life? And I had just happened to be reading in the book of Acts that week. I was in Acts chapter three and I quoted this scripture to him. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then the times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And he said, what does that mean? And I I said, that means you close porn business. Step one. He said, sell it. I said, no, close it. He said, it's worth a ton of money. And I said, God will take care of you. That's the Jesus worldview. The world's view is sell it, move it along to someone else. The Jesus worldview is shut this thing down because I have an opportunity to deal with some evil in the world that tore my family apart. And God knows what it's doing to other families. He tore that whole thing down. Said you gotta go full surrender to Jesus, man. Full on. In the coming months, his family was put back together. And I can't tell his whole story because of time, but but now he owns a very successful HVAC plumbing business up in the in the northeast part of the country. And it's all because he got the right world view. That's why. That's why. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I hope you're starting to think about your worldview. And I hope that you'll come back next couple of weeks as we dive deeper. And I hope that if you felt like today you're you're ping-ponging, you're mixing in some stuff from the kingdom of darkness that, that you'll stop immediately so you're not sucked into this vortex called the world's view. Do you have blind spots? That's a question. Do you have any blind spots? And if you're not a Jesus follower, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, if you've never allowed him to, to redeem your soul, to save you, if you've never made that, that decision, you can make that decision now. And you don't have to worry about anything else that, that we drew on the board today. That stuff will all come as you follow Jesus over time. Don't worry about all that other stuff. We'll get there. First, you just make, must make a, a choice, a personal, conscious, intentional, choice. And what most people do is they look at all the other stuff and they're like, I can't do it. I'm not sure I believe all that. That's why the Bible says it's a step of faith. A step of faith. I don't have much faith. Jesus said, just a little bit of faith. Faith like a mustard seed. So if you're willing to take that faith-filled step today, would you pray like this? And let's pray it together. Heavenly Father, I surrender. I choose you, not the world. You can have it all my whole life. I'm yours. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for Jesus, his blood, his sacrifice, and his resurrection. I repent from my sins, God. I come before you with a humble heart. I need you. Would you change me and make me new? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's make some noise for our guys doing all over the place. Come on.